Near the foot of Edinburgh's Royal Mile, opposite Holyrood Palace, stands the modern Scottish Parliament building. Built after the devolution referendum in 1997 and officially opened in 2004, the building is now space for democratic discussions and debates that shape the future of Scotland. Further up the mile, there is Parliament House, a grand and imposing building situated in the heart of Edinburgh's historic old town. Parliament House is a prominent symbol of Scotland's legal and political history and, until the early 18th century, the site of the Old Parliament of Scotland. Originally constructed in 1639 and the world's first purpose-built parliament, this magnificent edifice has witnessed centuries of political debates, legal proceedings and significant events that have shaped the nation. It was here in 1706 that the Treaty of Union was signed by a group of English and Scottish commissioners, nominated by Queen Anne, the then monarch, with guidance from the Duke of Argyll and James Douglas, the second Duke of Queensbury. The Douglas family lived in a grand house in the Canning Gate called Queensbury House, which still stands to this day. Queensbury House holds a fascinating and storied past that dates back to the 17th century. Built around 1680, it was originally built for Lord Hatton as a master of the Scottish Mint. Ownership transferred over to William Douglas, the first Duke of Queensbury, a prominent figure in Scottish politics during the Restoration period, when he bought the house in 1686. Williams would be the first death in the house in 1695, and after this, ownership of Queensbury House passed to his son, James, the second Duke of Queensbury. Two years later, in 1697, Douglas had a son, also called James, but young James would go on to earn a far less distinguished title. From an early age, it became clear that young James wouldn't live a traditional life. He was prone to fits of anger and violent outbursts. He'd attack those charged with raising him and punch or bite children he should have been playing with. His reputation earned at such a young age led him to be described by some who knew him or witnessed his behaviour as an imbecile or violently insane. Due to his nature and the sensibilities of the day, the Douglases took a drastic course of action. They locked him away in a room that only had one way in or one way out, and the key to that room was held only by his father. The only human interaction young James had in the years he was locked up was when he was given his daily food or held down so he could be cleaned and changed. This drastic and inhumane act was taken as a safety precaution, not for James, but for the others who lived in the house. In 1707, when James was 10, the Treaty of the Union was signed. The treaty united the kingdoms of Scotland and the Kingdom of England into a single sovereign state known as the Kingdom of Great Britain. On the day of signing, there was a mixture of celebration and rioting. The union was unpopular among ordinary people. As Rabbi Burns so eloquently put it, were bought and sold for English gold, such a parcel of rogues in a nation. But for those who would prosper, the Union brought opportunity and the promise of riches. The Duke of Queensbury was among this group, and he and his family are believed to have left Queensbury House to join in with the celebrations, or to escape while the city rioted. During this time, only a kitchen boy was left in the house, along with young James. No one knows how. Perhaps it happened during the rush to celebrate or the panic to escape, but somehow James's door was left unlocked and unguarded. A few hours passed before the Duke, his family and the rest of the servants returned, tired and hungry. Stepping into the grand home, they were met with the unmistakably pleasant smell of a roaring fire and assumed a meal was being prepared. While the family retreated to their private quarters, one servant followed the smell and walked down the twisting stone staircase towards the kitchen to see what was being cooked. 
None of the usual candles had been lit in the dark and gloomy room. The only light was coming from the large open fire used to cook. The flames cast shadows that danced along the stone walls. As they stood at the entrance to the kitchen, the servant could see the silhouette of a small figure with her back to them sat to the side of the fire, working the spit. Assuming it was the kitchen boy, they called out to him and asked what was being prepared, but received no answer. They called again, still no answer. Frustrated by this perceived insolence, they approached the boy and tapped him on the shoulder. The face that met them when he turned round was not that of the kitchen help, but that of young James, who had escaped his confinement. It was then that the servant's horrified gaze fell upon what was being cooked on the spit, the body of the poor, unfortunate kitchen boy. A horrendous scream shattered the silence and echoed around the halls of the lofty mansion. Everyone in the house heard it and immediately rushed to the kitchen to investigate. While he ran to the kitchen, the servant who discovered this macabre scene ran in the opposite direction, out into the street, screaming as they went. The Duke's reaction was just as horrified. His young son had killed, cooked and eaten a servant in his charge. The young boy's blood was splattered on the walls around the fireplace and smeared over the grinning mouth of his own flesh and blood. Young James was immediately apprehended and confined to his room, and the remains of the poor kitchen boy were solemnly removed from the spit. The aftermath of this story is almost as horrific as the act itself. The power and the position the Duke held meant no criminal charges were brought against his murderous son. Other than some critics of the Treaty of Union who claimed it a judgement on the Duke for his odious share in the Union, it was almost as if the abhorrent event hadn't happened. In fact, his heir was allowed to inherit the Marquisate and Earldom of Queensbury, but due to his mental state, he didn't succeed to the Dukedom. Although young James passed away in 1715, the harrowing impact of this tragic event continues to reverberate through the ages. Frequently, the air around the fireplace is filled with eerie and terrified screams, haunting the space with their inexplicable origin. Many witnesses have described these bone-chilling cries as the anguished voice of a young boy, forever etched into the history of the place. From the early 1800s until 1996, Queensbury House was used as a hospital or home for the elderly. Throughout this time, chilling reports emerged of shadowy forms seen darting around the cold and drafty corridors. And blood-curdling screams have been seemingly unrelated to any of the patient's voices. Some nursing staff even spoke of being pinned against walls in one particular area by an unseen force. Perhaps this is where James grabbed the unsuspecting kitchen boy before slaughtering him. In an ironic turn of events in 1997, Queensbury House, once owned by a man in part responsible for the dissolution of the old parliament, was acquired by the newly formed parliament and is now used as a space for administrative staff. While the past horrors of the kitchen boy's tragic fate may still echo within the walls, the area where the oven still stands has undergone a modern refurbishment, transforming into an exclusive private bar for MPs and their guests. As they raise their glasses in a toast, one can't help but wonder, are these the only spirits that remain in Queensbury House?